Defense appropriations bill, by far the largest of the 12 in terms of money. Uh, before we begin, uh, the, uh, our beloved member, uh, Alan Nunnally, as you, I'm sure, know, underwent surgery some 12 hours yesterday uh, for a tumor uh, on the brain, and that's about the extent of my knowledge of, of, of things. But he successfully came through the operation about uh, 8 o'clock last night, uh, and I, that's all I know. If anyone knows more, uh, feel free to share it with us. Uh, we, we will be sending flowers to the uh, uh, hospital in uh, Houston, MD Anderson, where uh, the surgery took place. I know all of our hearts are with uh, Alan and his family, and our prayers would be welcomed. Uh, and so I urge you to so do. I want to congratulate uh, all of you on the hard work so far. In addition to uh, marking up our eighth bill and subcommittee just before we came here, the Energy and Water Bill, uh, we have two bills on the floor this week uh, and one more to complete in full committee. So we're working at a great pace and uh, I hope we can continue that today. Uh, as we've said before, this is the uh, <coughs> From all indications, the earliest <coughs> the committee has been able to bring these bills out uh, at least since 1974 <coughs> with the advent of the uh, Budget Control Act of that year, and perhaps even before that. At any rate, you're, you're working hard, and I appreciate it very much. It's a good pace. Uh, the uh, THUD bill is on the floor today again, and uh, there's some 20 amendments that uh, are now pending, but they disposed of a lot last night, and we should finish that bill before the dinner hour uh, t today, hopefully. Today we've got to, uh, we, we're, we, when that bill goes back on the floor, what time? About 12.30ish, which means we've got to be through with this bill by that time. So, again, as you have been in the past, you've been concise and brief and terse in your remarks, and I want to congratulate you for being efficient with your time and hours, and we need that again today. So I urge you to so do. Uh, so with that, uh, we now turn to Chairman Rodney Freelingheisen to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when our defense bill started its hearing process several months ago, uh, I laid before them several, several key questions. First, how do we ensure that our men and women in uniform have the resources they need to defend our nation and support their families? Second, what are the risks associated with the decisions we make on the size of the military, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines? And what capabilities do we want our military and intelligence community to develop and to modernize? Third, are those risks tolerable given the threats and conflicts we can reasonably be expected to face as a nation and as a world leader? And fourth, with so many demands and such limited resources, what specifically do we hope to achieve through the 200, 2015 budget? People around the world, our allies and adversaries, are looking at this proposal to see how we answer these questions. And I believe our response reassures our allies and deters our enemies. The fiscal year 2015 Department of Defense Appropriations measure I present this morning was reported out unanimously by the subcommittee on May 30th. It is a culmination of 13 hearings, eight official briefings, and countless staff hours. It is also the product of a bipartisan cooperative effort for which I thank my good friend, the ranking member Pete Vyskoski. No one could have a better partner in this process. We share opinions, we've shared travel, we share briefing, and we also share an incredible amount of pride in the men and women who serve us uh, in the military. We also share a great group of committed committee members, and I want to thank all of those committee members for their full participation. And we share the best staff. 
led by Tom McLemore and Paul Jola. There's no separation between the, the R's and D's. This is a, a, an enormously successful staff that has worked on your behalf and on behalf of the nation. Of course, we, we couldn't do any of that without uh, the leadership of uh, Chairman Hal Rogers and the ranking member of Nita Lowy, uh, getting us back to a regular order, which is important, especially when it comes to issues of national defense, and uh, for creating what I call a, a climate for bipartisan, uh, bipartisanship, uh, something which we do need more of. As you're aware, we've not received the recommendation for the Overseas Contingency Operations, a.k.a. OCO. So we're forced to present a $79.4 billion, $79 billion placeholder as the administration finalizes its plans for the enduring U.S. presence in Afghanistan. This level will be subject to change. We'll talk about this in greater detail in a few minutes. I think we should all agree America must continue to lead in this bipartisan bill adds $1.2 billion to fill readiness shortfalls that enable that leadership. That is important. Beyond operation and maintenance, this recommendation also includes the following. $534 million to fully fund the authorized 1.8 percent pay increase for the troops. $789 million to begin the refueling of the USS George Washington, a vital power projection platform. $5.8 billion for a total of 38 joint strike fighters, $970 million to buy 12 additional electronic attack growlers, an item high on the Navy's unfunded priority list, and $120 million to upgrade the M1 Abrams tanks, and $351 million for the Israeli Cooperative Program, and an additional $39 million for suicide prevention activities, 19 of which is targeted specifically to our special forces. In that regard, uh, I I'm sure some of you may or may not be aware that we lost uh, five of these special operators uh, uh, yesterday in uh, southern Afghanistan. I know that you will uh, remember those soldiers and their families uh, in, your, in your thoughts and in the future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, these are just a few examples of our commitment to U.S. military dominance across the air, land, and sea, our commitment to the service members and their families as well as our commitment to our allies. In short, this bill provides the Department with much-needed resources to modernize and maintain readiness at the levels which will allow the military and the intelligence community to preserve our, its status as the most capable and superior armed forces in the world, and I urge its adoption. <laughs> Finally, before I yield back, let me recognize again our great committee staff on both sides of the aisle and thank Mr. Visklowski for his hard work and diligence on this bill. He's been an invaluable partner throughout the process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Visklowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, thank you very much for the recognition. And Chairman Friedlinghausen, thank you very much for all of your kind work. And I would certainly echo them. Uh, I want to congratulate you on the bipartisan and transparent manner uh, in which you have crafted the fiscal year 2015 defense bill. Uh, in your inaugural year as the chairman of the defense subcommittee, you have continued the strong collegial tradition uh, set by our predecessors. Further, and it's very important to the members of this committee, you have been an unrelenting advocate for the oversight responsibilities and the constitutional prerogative of the subcommittee, thus our full committee, in areas of the Department of Defense that have lapsed and ignored the import of Article I, Section 9. I also do want to thank uh, the Chairman, uh, Mr. Rogers, as well as Ranking Member Lowy, uh, and the members of the subcommittee for all of their efforts. Uh, and would join uh, the chair in thanking each member of our staff uh, as well as all of the associate staff. Uh, one of my points of pride, and I try not to be a prideful person, uh, is the first job I had on Capitol Hill uh, was an associate staff position uh, for this great uh, committee. I do appreciate uh, the work of the staff. I would also be remiss, and I think the chairman joins me, in recognizing that three of our colleagues on the subcommittee uh, this will be their last markup with us. Uh, Mr. Moran, who, because of a funeral uh, obligation, uh, could not be with us uh, today. 
uh, Mr. Kingston and Mr. Owens, uh, all of whom have made very valuable contributions to the subcommittee. Uh, they will be greatly missed. Before I enter into other remarks uh, about the merits of the base bill, I would like to discuss the overseas contingency operation title that the chairman alluded to. As I have stated during hearings this year, the committee has been placed in a very difficult position of having to defend a $79.4 billion placeholder. While the administration's recent decision on post-2014 troop levels in Afghanistan clears up the major policy issue that was allegedly holding back a detailed budget request, the outlook for OCO funding has been further muddled by the proposed $5 billion counterterrorism partnerships fund, and most recently the announcement of a $1 billion European reassurance initiative, all of which the subcommittee has no details for. At a time when many in Congress are rightfully looking to limit what is an eligible expense in OCO and shift activities to the base budget, these new proposals will further complicate the committee's tasks. It is very difficult to budget in opaque. I support the bill. Put simply, the bill provides for the stability of our military personnel, maintains readiness, and preserves the industrial base. I am pleased that the subcommittee continues efforts on sexual assault. The chairman mentioned our efforts on traumatic brain injuries, psychological health, and suicide prevention. Specific to readiness, uh, the bill includes an increase of $1 billion to fill key gaps in programs to prepare our troops, including $135 million for the Army Reserve and Army National Guard. The bill makes investments in programs that are vital to the rebuilding and resetting of the force after 12 years of conflict. I appreciate the chairman's focus on encouraging DOD to meet the 20 17 deadline for achieving fully audible financial statements. The measure before us provides an additional $8 million above the Comptroller's Office request to improve business and financial systems throughout the Department of Defense. With regards to the industrial base, I was dismayed that in its fiscal year 2015 budget request, the administration proposed the elimination of several long-standing general provisions in our bill that ensure that contracts follow Buy America requirements and support domestic manufacturing. I am pleased to note, uh, under the leadership of the chairman, the committee chose to reject the administration's inexplicable proposal to jettison these Buy America provisions, and they can be found in the bill. The bill also contains several other provisions and initiatives aimed at securing our industrial base, including the addition of $220 million to establish a program for the domestic development of a next generation liquid rocket engine. One area of the bill I would like to highlight is a funding increase for the Humanitarian Mine Action Program. Albeit a small program, $8.8 .8 million, I believe it's a mission of immense value. All too often, innocent civilians are the victims of explosive remnants of war. However, there are certain aspects of the bill that give me pause. Fundamentally, uh, these concerns have little to do with the detailed work of the subcommittee, which has done its various best under the constraints in which it operated. Rather, the concerns stem from Congress's continued failure to confront our long-term fiscal challenges. In its 2015 budget request, the Department of Defense proposed some significant initiatives, including military pay change, restructuring TRICARE, the retirement of several weapon systems, such as the A-10 and Kiowa Warrior, in order to stay under the fiscal year 15 budget cap, provide for future flexibility, and meet the national security strategy. Having said this, so one could easily point out that the administration then undercut its own efforts by planning for higher spending in fiscal years 2016 through 2019 and by submitting the disingenuously named Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative and subsequently submitting unfunded priority lists. Regardless, a number of the proposals by the department do possess merit. With few exceptions, so these proposals have gained no traction within the United States Congress. Most were excluded or her language prohibiting or postponing their start in the recently passed National Defense Authorization Act. I do not suggest that the administration is uniformly correct, nor do I dismiss the resultant impacts of many of these initiatives. 
but the alternatives of staying the course and hoping for some fiscal relief next year is wishful thinking. The sooner Congress reaches the consensus required to make difficult decisions that are essential to deal with the reality of finite resources, the better we can provide for our national defense. In closing, again, I want to thank uh, very sincerely the Chairman for his deliberative work in crafting this very, very good and strong bill. And I thank the staff and Mr. Chairman. I thank you for the recognition. Thank you, Mr. Visklowski. I want to congratulate both you and the Chairman uh, for a job well done. This is a tough bill, the biggest, as I said, of all of the bills that we produce and uh, a half of all discretionary spending. Uh, and I want to particularly uh, thank Chairman Freelinghuysen. This is, this is uh, his first bill as chairman of the subcommittee for shepherding through the process a very, very difficult chore. Our highest priority as a nation must be national security, to protect American interests at home and abroad. This bill, $570.4 billion in discretionary funding, uh, supporting our brave war fighters and their families uh, that help ensure the success of our military missions and that keep all Americans as safe as possible in an ever-changing world. A strong military begins with well-cared-for servicemen and women. This bill fully funds the authorized 1.8 percent pay raise for the military instead of the 1 percent that the President had requested. This will ensure that our more than 1.3 million active duty troops and 820,000 guard and reserve troops have the quality of life they deserve during their service. In addition, the bill provides $31.6 billion for the Defense Health Program to care for our troops, our their families and our retirees. Within this total, uh, the bill includes increases above the President's request for cancer research, traumatic brain injury research, psychological health research, and suicide prevention outreach programs. The bill also addresses an ongoing challenge facing our military, increasing sexual assault prevention and response programs by 50 million above last year's level. This legislation also prioritizes critical readiness programs and the procurement of resources needed to maintain the most capable and effective military in the world now and into the future. Targeted increases are made to important defense technology R&D to help advance the safety and success of our military operations. We've also increased funding to procure the equipment needed to maintain our military readiness. These platforms, weapons, and other equipment help train our troops, maintain our force, and conduct successful military operations. Other funding in the bill supports key readiness programs, flight time and battle training, facility maintenance, and base operations. Lastly, the bill provides $79.4 billion in overseas contingency operation funding to support our troops in Afghanistan. This funding will require further evaluation as we have yet to receive an official budget request that reflects current status of our troops in the field. While this bill uh, funds the core duties of the Department of Defense, it also fulfills our duty to be careful stewards of taxpayer dollars. The bill reflects common sense decisions to save dollars wherever possible and help encourage greater efficiency within the Department of Defense. For example, the bill rescinds $965 million of unused prior year funding, almost a billion. I will note that uh, none of the reductions or rescissions in this bill will affect the safety or success of our troops and its missions. For that, I would like to thank the chairman and the ranking member uh, and the members of the subcommittee, as I know that achieving these savings was not without a good deal of work and a sharp eye for detail. So thank you, 
And also, thanks to the staff, as has been said, for their support and dedication to this uh, fine piece of legislation. You all know how hard work, uh, what kind of hard work our staff puts out on producing all these bills. Uh, and they deserve the credit. So staff, we thank you for great work. So I'm proud to say I uh, support this bipartisan bill, and I urge the committee to approve it. Mrs. Lloyd. Well, thank you, Chairman Rogers. Thank you, Chairman Freilinghausen, Frankie Member Vesklosky. The Defense Subcommittee has had a long tradition of working closely together, and I sincerely appreciate efforts to work across the aisle on the bill before us today. Totally, totaling $490.7 billion, the base portion of the bill is approximately $200 million above the President's request. However, after accounting for appropriate increases in active duty pay and housing costs, the remainder of the bill is actually below the President's proposed level. Budget caps and sequestration force difficult decisions, which will be debated today and on the House floor. And before we begin that discussion, I want to again thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member and their very, very capable staffs, because they did recognize the constraints under which they assembled this bill. The bill includes a number of provisions I strongly support. <coughs> Additional investments to address the epidemic of sexual assault plaguing our military. Substantial funds for health services and suicide prevention. A 1.8% increase for active duty pay support for the National Guard and Reserves, as well as family support programs, significant funding for cybersecurity to protect our critical infrastructure from cyber attacks, and continued support for the Israeli Cooperative Program. I also applaud the committee for including language that fences 75% of funds for the Defense Healthcare Management System modernization, requiring a report from the Secretary of Defense on acquisition and the cost of the program, plus the status of efforts to achieve interoperability with the Department of Veterans Affairs. This system is critical to the health of our service members, and expeditious interoperability with the VA is essential to ensuring quality of care as they become <laughs> veterans. Through continued oversight, this committee will make certain that the DOD stays on course and delivers the promised objectives. I do hope that's the case. It's almost an embarrassment, Mr. Chairman, that after so many hearings and months of discussion and years of work, they still are not interoperable and we still not, have not accomplished our goals. But we're going to be following this carefully, and I do hope we can declare success in that arena. I also remain concerned about the lack of a formal budget request for the Overseas Contingency Operation Funds, with continued uncertainty about future U.S. actions in Afghanistan. Work remains on this account. Again, I appreciate the professionalism collegiality of the process and look forward to further cooperation as we work towards passing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, are there amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a manager amendment and I ask that it could be, could be considered read. Amendment offered by Mr. Without objection, <coughs> the reading is dispensed with the Chairman. Mr. Second. Chairman, the manager's amendment incorporates various non-controversial items to the bill and report. I believe members have a copy in front of them. Uh, this has been cleared with a minority. It's not controversial. I move that the amendment be adopted. Mr. Wisklowski. The amendment has been prepared in conjunction with the minority. I support it. Further discussion? Mr. Quigley. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you and the ranking member um, for including language I proposed into the uh, manager's amendment on the potential for NATO cost sharing of our forward deployed nuclear weapons. I'm a Cub fan. I'm used to losing. 
Uh, not used to winning anything here. I was prepared to go down in another bla flaming ball of martyrdom this morning, but uh, I'm encouraged the committee recognizes these issues, and I look forward to working with you uh, together on these issues. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, the question is on the manager's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Freelinghuysen. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk labeled Freelinghuysen number two. I uh, consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with and the chairman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, this amendment does three things. First, it clarifies that no funds in this act to be used in contravention of Section 1035 of the Fiscal Year 2014 National Defense Authorization Act, the section that requires 30 days prior notification before any de detainees at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba are transferred to a foreign country. Second, it withholds 85 percent of all OCO funding, overseas contingency operations funding, until the detailed spend plan is provided, and that spend plan must include an insurance that no funds will be used in violation of, of Section 1030 of the Fiscal Year 2000 NDAA. Third, it, it adds language to our report highlighting a serious breakdown in communication by the administration to Congress, a co-equal branch of government. Truth be told, I truly regret I have to offer this amendment. I recognize that there are many layers to this complex situation and we'll leave it to the Army, the investigation of Sergeant Bergdahl's conduct and motivation. However, to put it simply, on behalf of this committee, I'm angered at the lack of respect for the law and for Congress as an equal partner. I move that the amendment be adopted. Mr. Fiskowski. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I want to add my voice to the chairman's. I am in full support of his amendment, uh, and I agree with his assertion uh, that the law, as explained in Section 1035, uh, has not been followed. Section 1035 of the Fiscal Year 2014 Authorization Act provides that the Secretary of Defense shall notify the appropriate committees of Congress not less than 30 days before the transfer or release of an individual. The appropriate committees of Congress include this committee. The administration attempted to contact committee members and staff within hours of the transfer of the detainees. The administration had been pursuing the possibility of an exchange since 2011, indicating that time was available to comply with the notification provision. And I would point out, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, this amendment follows a course charted uh, in several other instances in the bill by responding to occurrences where it appears existing law has not been followed uh, or the department does not have a full appreciation for our constitutional prerogatives. So again, uh, do strongly support uh, the chairman's initiative and think he has taken a balanced and measured approach uh, in his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the chairman yield to a question? Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Is it, was it also the law under the uh, authorization committee's bill for last year that uh, the president had to give Congress at least 30 days notice before any transfer of a detainee was effective? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Was there notice given? No, Mr. Chairman. And what's the remedy? This is a, the partial remedy that uh, we're sending a message that the law is the law, whether it's passed uh, the authorization bill or whether it's the appropriations bill, because we pay the bills. This is a way of sending a message to the administration that we need to be notified as an equal, co-equal co branch of government. Well, officials of the administration have said that uh, there were some 80 or 90 people in the administration who knew of the uh, intended transfer of these five detainees at Gitmo, 80 or 90, none of whom were members of Congress, that the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee, the ranking Democrats on those committees, uh, the chairman of the uh, House uh, uh, Armed Services Committee, none of them were clued in to what was about to take place or asked their opinion 
or ask for wise counsel. And yet, the administration went ahead with no, uh, with no uh, respect for the law, no respect for the Congress, and uh, now are sort of waving their thumb at us. And uh, so what would the gentleman's amendment do that would add to the fact that it was illegal to transfer those five prisoners? Well, the, the, the law we passed last year should have been uh, strong enough. I just reemphasizes the fact that uh, uh, we pay the bills. This is a, this is a spending limitation, and we're going to hold up uh, uh, the, the bill until we get uh, further uh, uh, support for, for the law and respect for the Constitution. Is there further discussion? Uh, you heard the uh, amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. no. Roll call. Requested. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Amaday. Yes. Mr. Amaday, aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Crenshaw. Mr. Crenshaw, aye. Mr. Cuellar? Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? Ms. DeLauro? No. Ms. DeLauro, no. Mr. Dent? Aye. Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. Diaz-Balart? Mr. Diaz-Balart, aye. Mr. Farr? No. Mr. Farr, no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fleischman? Aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Aye. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Freelingheisen? Aye. Mr. Freelingheisen, aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves? Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mr. Honda. Mr. Honda. Mr. Honda, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. Aye. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kingston. Aye. Mr. Kingston, aye. Mr. Latham. Aye. Mr. Latham, aye. Ms. Lee. No. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Present. Ms. McCollum, present. Mr. Moran. Mr. Nunnally. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens, aye. Mr. Pastor. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley, no. Ms. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Robo Allard. No. Ms. Robo Allard, no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, Mr. Serrano, <coughs> Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, aye, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, aye, Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, aye, Mr. Visklowski, Mr. Visklowski, aye, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no, Mr. Wolf, Mr. Wolf, aye, Mr. Womack, Mr. Womack, aye, Mr. Yoder, Mr. Yoder, aye. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah, no. Ms. McCollum? Ms. McCollum, no. Are there members who wish to change their vote? Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, no. Mr. DeLauro? Mr. Chairman, while they're, they're counting, I, I, I would just make well, one. Hold, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Are there members who wish oh. to change their vote? Okay, sorry. Or be recorded. Mr. Pastor? No. Mr. Pastor, no. Clerk will tally. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Usually, I mean, we, we have a minute or two here. I'm not going to take very much time. The general lady is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say with regard to this, I'm sorry I didn't say it before the vote, but um, the fact is that the president of uh, of the United States is the commander in chief. Well, the gentle lady is out of order. This we've already voted on the matter, and Mr. the roll call is being conducted. Gentle lady is not in order. If it's a point of order on some procedure of the committee, no, it is. It is just, a, but not to argue the merits. I'm not going to argue the merits. The gentle lady is not in order. This is outrageous that this committee has become. The gentle lady is not recognized. 
On this vote, the yeas are 33, the nays are 13. The amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments? Ms. Lee. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. This is uh, Lee number one. Clerk will read. Uh, amendment offered by Ms. Lee. At the end of the bill, before the spending reduction account, insert the following. None of the funds made available. Consent, uh, consent Without objection, consent. the reading is dispensed with. Ms. Lee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On March 31, 2014, the Army issued an updated regulation on the wear and appearance of Army uniforms. Now, for members who are not aware, these regulations, and I want to walk you through this for just a minute uh, on this amendment, because I think it's very important to understand why I'm doing this. These regulations specify hairstyles often worn by many African-American women and other minority women as unauthorized. I understand the intent of the updated regulation, and that is to ensure uniformity in our military. And as the daughter of a veteran, 25 years, uh, believe me, I understand what standards of uniformity mean. But the unintended consequences of these discriminatory regulations have they disproportionately target women of color with little regard to what is needed to maintain their natural hair. If I may, let me just read to you directly from the Army regulation. Twists. Twists are defined as twisting two distinct st strands of hand around one another to create a twisted rope-like appearance. Although some twists may be temporary and can be easily untwisted, they are unauthorized. Dreadlocks. Dreadlocks are defined as any matted, twisted, or locked coils or ropes of hair or extensions. Any style of dreadlock against the scalp or free hanging is not authorized. Braids or corn, uh, excuse me, cornrows that are unkempt, kept, or matted are considered dreadlocks and are not authorized. Now, each of these sections regulating hair have a direct impact on the ability of minority women to wear their hair in natural styles, forcing them to resort to chemicals straightening their hair or wearing wigs and hair extensions, which can be incredibly damaging to hair. And for women who would still attempt to wear their hair naturally, these regulations further restrict them by defining what is considered appropriate natural hair. Paragraph 3B, in describing medium length hair, the regulation states that medium hair may fall naturally and uniform and is not required to be secured. Yet in Section C, the regulation goes on to state that no portion of the bulk of the hair as measured from the scalp will exceed two inches except a bun, which may extend a maximum three inches from the scalp and can be no wider than the width of the head. Now, Mr. Chairman, here's the problem. When many minority women wear their hair in natural, unprocessed forms, such as mine, it grows out, not down in a way that would fall naturally. And because it grows out and not down, it may often extend more than two inches from the scalp. Unfortunately, these regulations, are dra as drafted, do nothing but marginalize and single out a group of women and their traditional hairstyles as other and unacceptable for duty. Now, 31 percent of women, excuse me, 31 percent of our service women are African-American women. That's three in 10 of active duty service members are affected by this. In April, the 16 women of the Congressional Black Caucus sent a letter to Secretary Hagel expressing our serious concerns about these regulations, I'm, and I'm pleased to report that he has agreed to review these policies. But until that review is complete, we should not fund the implementation of a policy that discriminates against a significant portion, again, 31 percent of our service members. Supporting this amendment will ensure that none of the grooming and appearance policies of the armed services are discriminatory against anyone. These women are bravely serving this country. They're proud service members, and they should not be targeted or attacked intentionally or not based on his or her appearance. Thank you very much. Chairman Friedenhaus. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to uh, uh, accept the uh, uh, lady's uh, amendment. Uh, I think the Secretary uh, Hagel is, is doing a review 
I think we obviously should wait on the view, but I, I, I would, I, I'm pleased to accept the amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Freeling has it. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Piskowski. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm pleased to hear that the, uh, the chairman is uh, willing to accept the language of the amendment. I, I do think it's important to point out that uh, this issue is not only a problem for officially recognized minority women. The odds of uh, women of my ethnicity and, uh, and, uh, and hair uh, character of getting this hair into that uh, set of parameters are between slim and none. And uh, so it is important for a broad spectrum of women of all ethnic and uh, racial backgrounds to be able to be more in compliance with a reasonable policy on hair for women, and particularly as we encourage and have more and more women join the ranks of our military. So uh, I appreciate the gentlelady's uh, amendment and the chairman's willingness to accept it. Is on the. Is the okay. Th thank you very much. No, I just um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for accepting the amendment. The question yeah. is on the Lee Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there other amendments? Uh, Mr. Kingston. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, and I ask the consent that the amendment be considered as read. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Kingston. Without objection, the reading is page four, line eight, and is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the amendment regarding the A-10, and I want to talk about preserving the A-10 for two reasons. Number one, cost savings, and number two, safety of our troops on the ground. And before I talk about it, I want to say that um, the authorizing committee has already acted on this and kept the A-10 mission. They offset it with OCO money, which, as the ranking member has already expressed, we really don't have the OCO money yet, and so as the chairman, so I'm not going to that account. What we do is basically take it out of the $35 billion O&M account and say find the money within there. But the authorizing committee um, language has already passed the House floor. The Senate committee is doing the same thing, and so I just want to say that there, there are other committees that are addressing this as well. Now, the reason that the Air Force is recommending the discontinuation of the A-10 is because they say that it will save money. But I want to point out to you that um, the A-10 uh, cost is 24 percent less than an F-16, 54 percent less than the F-15E, uh, F e, and 68 percent less than the B-1. And so the Air Force should be saving money. I applaud their efforts. But going to uh, aircraft that is the, one of the least expensive ones to fly does not make any sense. Now, number two, and prob probably uh, definitely far more important, is the safety on the ground. I have the honor of representing four major military installations and in every branch of the military, and if I want to hear about how good the A-10 is, I, I don't just talk to the Air Force, I talk to the Army, talk to the Marines, and they like it because it is close air support. And um, just uh, you probably know some of the capabilities, but um, the GAU-8 Avenger 35-millimeter um, rot uh, rotary cannon on it is one of the most powerful weapons um, in the air, 3,900 rounds per minute, 65 rounds per second, with an accuracy of 80 percent of its shots being placed in a 40-foot circle from 4,000 feet. Um, the A-10 usually carries about 1,100 rounds on combat missions. It also has the AGM-65 Maverick surface-to-air missiles. Um, and in addition, it can carry cluster bombs, rocket pads, uh, uh, joint-directed <coughs> attack munitions. Um, it's a great weapon. It is the warthog, uh, as the affectionate name of it is. Um, one incident in Iraq, or excuse me, Afghanistan um, last July, uh, just less than a year ago, involved a convoy of ours being ambushed and the commander bringing in the A-10 because the attackers were so close they could not get a helicopter ev evacuation. The A-10 came in there, uh, made 15 passes, um, firing near nearly 2,300 rounds and dropping three 500-pound bombs and saved the lives of 60 Americans. 
I'll just close on this note. Um, in the Senate hearing, Joe, General Odiero said, and I quote, the A-10 is the best close air support platform we have today. It's perfectly, in, uh, it's performed incredibly well in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our soldiers are very confident in the system. Uh, General Cam Campbell, uh, Army Vice Chief, said on March 26, what I think the, the soldiers on the ground, both the special operators and conventional forces would tell you, it is a game changer. It's ugly, it's loud, but when it comes in and you hear that verve, it makes a difference. And it, so it would just be a game changer. And with that, I yield the yield. Mr. And Bishop. I uh, urge acceptance of the amendment. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I support uh, Mr. Kingston's amendment. I think it's an excellent amendment. There are a total of uh, 285 uh, A-10 aircraft around the country that provide support at uh, numerous uh, facilities, uh, which includes 143 assigned to active duty units, 85 with the Air National Guard, and 55 with our reserve units. Um, the A-10 uh, has excellent maneuverability at low air speeds uh, and low altitude, and highly accurate weapons delivery platforms, c capacity to loiter near the battle areas for extended periods of time, and operate under 1,000 foot ceilings uh, with uh, one and a half miles of visibility. Uh, the combat radius and short takeoff landings um, permit operations in and out of locations such as uh, Mr. Kingston just described. And of course, using night goggle visions, the pilots uh, can conduct their missions during darkness without having to use uh, a, a light. Uh, this, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many of our military personnel, would create a huge hole uh, in our air defense system without uh, any significant replacement. Uh, so I think that uh, the proposal to eliminate it uh, is penny-wise and pound-foolish, and I support the amendment and urge the committee to uh, uh, adopt Mr. Kingston's amendment. Mr. Pastor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I rise in support of the Kingston Amendment, uh, and I associate myself with the comments both by uh, Mr. Kingston and Mr. Bishop uh, in terms of the ability of the aircraft and its effectiveness. And as uh, Mr. Kingston uh, told us that the uh, administration uh, is divesting of the A-10 in 2015. And I believe that the House uh, Armed Services uh, Authorizing Committee, and, and as I understand the Senate, uh, will also uh, has included the authorization of the uh, warthog for remaining years. And I, and I think that probably uh, in their deliberations, they considered that, like most things in uh, the defense, uh, they come out with a program and usually uh, what happens is uh, they run short, and so the aircraft being effective as it is, that there is no real plan to uh, integrate uh, new aircraft that would take uh, its place, and so I think uh, both the House authorizers and probably the Senate authorizers are going to continue the authorization of the A-10 only because uh, they feel that the uh, Defense uh, Department uh, is going to fall short in its divesture, so for that reason I uh, join Mr. Kingston and Mr. Bishop in its support. Mr. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Chairman, I also rise to support this amendment. I do so not for fiscal reasons or financial considerations, but for operational considerations. I was an Air Force pilot for 14 years. I had a fairly unique career in that I flew combat rescue helicopters for seven years and then flew jets as well, one of the most sophisticated jets ever built. We flew operational and training missions with the A-10 all the time. Uh, close air support is a very, very delicate mission. It's best done at 250 knots and 50 feet, not at 20,000 feet and 600 knots. When you have troops that are in, close air, uh, are, are in contact with uh, enemy on the ground, it's a very, very precise mission. It's also a very unforgiving mission. If you go out and you hit the wrong bridge, people are going to forgive you for that. 
But if you get out and you frag your own troops, first place, you'll never forgive yourself. In the second place, you're going to end up in the newspaper. It's just something that is very difficult to do at that speed and at the altitudes that these other aircraft do it at. The pilots, this is the final consideration, the pilots who fly the A-10 train for this mission all the time. Other pilots have to split their time between training for air-to-air -air missions to training for other air interdiction missions. And these are some of the very best pilots at, the, at, at this mission that there is. In fact, they are the very best pilots at this mission. The A-10 was designed for this type of mission in mind. And, uh, and I, I, think, uh, I, I think it would be uh, terrible of judgment on this committee's part if we turn away uh, and don't support this aircraft in this mission. And I urge others to support this amendment. Chairman Freeling has it. Mr. Chairman, uh, respectfully, let me stipulate at the onset that the A-10 Thunderbolt is a tremendous aircraft. It is, though, 30 to 40 years old. And yes, there are soldiers, Marines, and corpsmen alive today because of its in incredible uh, ability to come to the rescue of people who need uh, assistance on the battlefield. But there are also troops who owe their lives to 80 percent of close air support missions flown by other aircraft, such as the F-16 and the B-1. The A-10 is an exceptional aircraft, aircraft for close air support. But close air support is not the only mission the Air, air Force must be able to perform. While the F-16 and B-1 can do what the A-10 does, the A-10 cannot do things that the F-16 and B-1 can do. The Air Force has rec recommended the retirement of the entire A-10 fleet. That's 283 A-frames. By 2019, in order to save billions, not millions, across the board in production and maintenance. This money could be plowed back into the procurement of modern multi-mission aircraft and research and development of a new generation of unmanned systems, a new long-range long strike bomber. Now, if this Air Force recommendation was just another green eyeshade exercise to save money, I'd be standing here supporting Mr. Kingston, not opposing him, because it is the mission, close air support for our soldiers and Marines, that is critically important not any one specific aircraft. This committee has been assured by Secretary James and General Welsh of the Air, Force, Air Force's dedication to close air support. Those soldiers and Marines will be protected. The Air Force is warning that future flights will see increasingly sophisticated anti-aircraft surface-to-air threats, making the slow-flying A-10 more vulnerable. The reality is the A-10 is the least equipped combat aircraft for this type of environment. We cannot assume we will always enjoy quick air dominance in future conflicts as we achieved in Iraq and Afghanistan. For these conflicts, conflicts will need speed, stealth, standoff weapons, and powerful electronic warfare systems, all of which the A-10 cannot provide. In this regard, the venerable Warthog is a weapon system that has served well in the past. They're recommending that it be retired. Make no mistake, the Air Force has been modernized to, to meet uh, evolving threats. If the next budget includes the A-10, the Air Force may propose eliminating the B-1 bomber fleet, eliminating 363 F-16s, more than one-third of the fleet that will uh, threaten, may, may I add, many guard and reserve uh, bases, further delay the F-35 procurement, uh, decline to shift 1,500 maintainers needed for F-16 and F-35 units, and possibly even terminating the combat rescue program that our troops also need desperately. So let's talk about the gentleman's pay for. He would essentially cut roughly $400 million from Air Force military personnel and operations maintenance accounts to provide funding to keep the Warthog flying for just one year. At a time when this committee struggles to find funds, to provide more robust funding for training, flying hours, depot aircraft overhauls, weapons sustainments, and facilities maintenance. This is a very damaging cut that could affect a lot of Air Force installations around the country that have never seen an A-10. I I I'm respectful of the heartfelt of view of this incredible aircraft, but uh, we, we need to know that uh, keeping this aircraft uh, going is going to uh, 
do things to other airframes and things that we need to do uh, to uh, uh, protect our troops. And uh, I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. And ask people to oppose it. Thank you. Mr. Visklowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, in my opening remarks, I mentioned uh, the failure of the United States Congress to begin to make some decisions and also referenced uh, that I do not dismiss the resultant impacts uh, of many of these initiatives. Uh, as the chairman indicated, and I would agree with him, I don't disagree with the assertions made by the proponents of the amendment that this is an incredible aircraft. I don't dismiss that. Uh, the fact is uh, the United States used the OH-58D Kiowa Warrior widely regarded as indispensable and unparalleled as far as a scout aircraft for the ground forces beginning in Vietnam. Today we use the AH-64 Apache for that and other missions. You had the EA-6B Prowler, Vietnam era electronic warfare aircraft that served as a critical platform for defeating enemy radar systems subplanted later by the F-18E Growler. It's probably an incredible stretch on my part, but you had the B-17 Flying Fortress during World War II. We now have the B-2 Stealth Bomber. Just because something has always been done a certain way is never a sufficient reason to continue to do it that way. Secondly, I wouldn't uh, disagree with the assertion made by the proponents uh, that the authorizers uh, turned down the administration's request. We're the Appropriations Committee. We've got to pay for it. We've got to pay for stuff, and that's a distinction. The fact is uh, eliminating the A-10 fleet yields significant savings, as the chairman alluded to. <coughs> Retaining it, as the chairman also alluded to, would cost between seven to eight billion additional dollars. The Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who, by the way, flew A-10s, indicate that if the Air Force were given $4.3 billion additionally under their future year planning document, the A-10 would not be among their priorities. They would rather spend that money on an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance program or a command and control capacity program or improvements to current aircraft <laughs> such as the F-15C and the F-16, wrapping up the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter or a C-130J recapitalization before they get to the A-10. would also point out to my colleagues that this is not a termination that happens like that. It is over a specific period of years. and would also point out that for those who have important interests and who have people working at these bases, before the deployment of those F-35s, there are plans as far as transition for reserve and National Guard units for airframes of the F-15E and the F-16. So these bases and these personnel would not be, not be denuded of aircraft. So again, would join the chairman in strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment as well-founded, as, as sincere as it is. Mr. Chairman? Chairman Simpson. Mr. Chairman, let me first say that I'm not a defense appropriator, have not sat on the committee, so I'm not an expert in the area. And I highly respect uh, the chairman and ranking member's opinion, even when I disagree with it. Uh, what I do know is that every infantryman I've ever talked to said when they're in the field what they want over their head is an A-10 because it does the job. Mr. Kingston and Mr. Stewart and Mr. Bishop and Mr. Pastor have probably described the A-10 better than I could about uh, what it does. Uh, and I certainly understand the Air Force's uh, goal to, to uh, uh, the challenges they have with the reduced budgets that we have and I strongly support their efforts to reduce spending and cut waste within the department. However, uh, it concerns me that the short-sighted decision to find savings by divestment in the A-10 uh, could likely bring about significant costs in the future, not to mention increased risk to service members who must rely on the A-10 for close air support. And I know that that's not the goal of either the chairman or the ranking member. 
As I said, I've spoken to men and women who operate the A-10 at the Idaho Air National Guard Base at Gallon Field in Boise, Idaho. And I do think it's a mistake for the Air Force to retire this aircraft without an appropriate replacement. And everyone I've talked to says that the F-16 can't actually do the ground support that the A-10 does. It can't do the same thing as Mr. Stewart uh, described so well. Congress has demonstrated support for the A-10 in the past because of its past combat performance, low operating costs, and unique capabilities, and I hope that it will do so by supporting this amendment. And remember, the Armed Services Committee in the House Reauthorization Bill supported the A-10. This is the only committee that is proposing to eliminate the A-10. Both the Senate committees and the House Armed Services Committee said, no, we need to keep the A-10 mission going. So I would hope you would support the amendment. There being uh, no further debate, uh, the gentleman is recognized to close for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I urge passage of this amendment. I just wanted to, to remind you two issues. Number one, troop safety. Number two, cost. I just want to start with the cost. A-10 is about $17,000 an hour. The F-16 is $22,000 an hour. The F-15E is $37,000 an hour. And the B-1 is $54,000 an hour to operate. If we're saving money, why would we eliminate the least expensive uh, platform to run? It's been suggested that this platform is obsolete, that it's 30 years old. True, however, Here's how relevant it has been in the Middle East. Between 2009 and 2012, the A-10 flew the, an average of 27,000 to 34,000 sorties a year. As recently as 2013, it flew approximately 14,000 sorties. This is not something that's yesterday's aircraft that's used on the ground. Again, to remind you what G General Odiero said, the uh, at, a-10 is the great close air support aircraft, our ground support aircraft. As far as we're concerned, it's the best one. Um, quote, again, another hearing, obviously we prefer the A-10. The soldiers like it. They can see it. They can hear it. They have confidence in it. That's the one thing that we have to account for as we move forward. Um, specific, and with that, I'll yield. <laughs> I do want to say this. We have one person who's been in the theater, one person who has been around these aircraft, Mr. Stewart, and he has stood in support of it. I think we should take his word for it if we don't uh, consider General Lord Arrows. Thank you, and I yield passage. Question is on the Kingston Amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. 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 The chair's in doubt. Can we have a show of hands? All in favor will raise their right hand. All opposed, all opposed will raise their right hand. That's sufficient. The uh, the noes uh, have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, what, what is the count on that? 1323. Thank you. Are there further amendments? Uh, the, the, the chair, though, wants to take notice that uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, as he said, a retired Air Force. What was your rank? <laughs> as a major. But the distinguishing feature of this man uh, in, in his military record is he still holds the world's record for the fastest nonstop circumnavigation of the globe. How long did it take you? And it was in a B-1 bomber and you refueled how many times? 
And is that still the world's record for time? It will be for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise to request time for five minutes. I rise to request time for five minutes. Gentlelady's recognized. And I yield to Mr. Laura. I want to thank the gentlelady for the time, and I'll be very brief. Um, the President of the United States has the authority to make decisions that are in the best national security interest of the United States. I strongly believe in congressional authority, and I believe that authority is critical <laughs> and it is important. But we also know that on numerous topics and in this committee that we give national security waivers to the President of the United States and to federal agencies because we believe that their number one job and their number one concern is to protect the United States of America. I thank the gentlelady for yielding time and I yield back. Are there further amendments? Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Cole at the appropriate place. Objection. The reading is dispensed with and the gentleman is recognized for Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Me, I'm going to withdraw this amendment, so I want folks to know that. But I want you to understand why I introduced the amendment basically would deny funding for the use of military facilities to, to house uh, people, these uh, illegal, uh, unaccompanied minors that are now entering the country in such vast numbers. And I'm sure you've been watching the press reports. Uh, this uh, particular population was at about 6,000 in terms of folks who were apprehended two or three years ago. 66 today, it's moving to the estimates very widely, but someplace between 120 and 100. 50,000 within the next two or three years. Now, this was not a problem that I pretend to know a great deal about. I'm not an expert on immigration. I don't sit on any of the committees that deal with it. Uh, but when the problem is so great that it's beginning to impinge into the defense of the country and the use of our military facilities, that catches my attention. Uh, the committee should know that uh, we are going to use a multiple military installations. One of them is in my district in full disclosure. Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the home of the field artillery. We're using and have used in the past, I think, a San, uh, San Antonio Lackland facility. Uh, we're going to use the uh, facility at Ventura. We're going to use facilities in the state of Washington. I understand Fort Drum is being considered as well. So we're now looking at a major expansion of what, quote, is an emergency measure. Uh, there's, my concerns are first, the way I learned about this was just from discussion, I got calls from the district. I had got no official notification from the administration. Nobody in our delegation had. The governor hadn't. We just began to hear that this might be possible last Wednesday. So I called the White House, uh, and they said, well, they didn't think this was true, but they would check. And I was talking with the ledge branch, so they don't know everything. They, and they literally couldn't get us back an answer before we had already confirmed that it, it was indeed happening. That is no way to conduct something like this where you're going to move six to twelve hundred people onto a military post in a relatively small sized community of eighty or ninety thousand uh, and and uh, nobody really knows what's happening or why so that is something that needs to be changed and i hope will be changed going forward second concern is military bases are not the appropriate places for these populations just not they're not designed for it they're not built for it uh, it's, uh, and frankly, everybody agrees. The administration claims this will be an, uh, an emergency measure and they will try and find more appropriate housing going forward. I take them at their word, but it does worry me. Anytime you start doing this in multiple facilities and it's done in a professional manner, as it will be, uh, the easy thing is just to continue doing it. Uh, and that, again, is very inappropriate. You're going to have hundreds of uh, uh, children, well, ju juveniles, really, 13 to 17, uh, on these facilities, plus their caretakers, all coming on. Some of those caretakers, by the way, they have to go through background checks. Some of them carry weapons because they're there for security. No military commander likes somebody bringing weapons 
onto his facility. So again, we haven't had incidents yet, although we have had, I guess, uh, in at least one place, a couple of people that were disqualified from, from coming in. So this is a serious, serious issue. Uh, and the third thing is we're not addressing the fundamental policy issue here. Uh, and I think I'll probably have a colloquy with my friend uh, who does Homeland Security on this in the future, but when a population expands this dramatically, y yes, they're leaving a very undesirable place, no doubt about it. But it's not that much different than it was two or three years ago. So you have to ask what's underway. And I've spent a lot of time the last few days doing a lot of asking with administration officials, had a very good brief, which I'm very appreciative of, from the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of uh, Defense, the Border Patrol, ICE, Department of Justice, you know, they're experts there, and they're grappling with a big problem. But part of this problem is clearly that once you get here, if you, I didn't know this before, but if you're uh, a uh, Mexican uh, uh, person, 13 to seven, uh, 17 years old, you're immediately returned. If we apprehend you, you go back that day, or as quickly as we can get you back in an appropriate fashion. But if you're coming from a non-contiguous country, in this case, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador is where most of these young people are coming from. Uh, we bring you in and we keep you at these facilities and we try and find a sponsor for you inside this country. And the odds are that you are going to stay here permanently. And that is being marketed down in these areas by people. These, these, don't, these kids are not moving up accidentally or on their own. They are being transported. We, they're, I'm told the cartels that bring them in are paid $2,500 to $5,000 per person. And then that young person begins a very dangerous journey in the company of very disreputable and dangerous people all the way across Mexico up here. And they're not safe until they get here, really. So anything that encourages this puts those young people at risk. And frankly, I would argue destabilizes the countries where they're coming from, just as our own drug trade destabilizes that area. You know, Americans need to take a long, hard look in the mirror about what is happening to some of these countries because we have this insatiable appetite for illegal drugs. This is a similar thing. But the people that are funding it, usually to try and help the kids, are basically funding a criminal operation. And it's a very lucrative and profitable one. And unwittingly, we have become uh, the people at the end of the trail that actually facilitate then the operation. So we need a major policy change because our policy, not, not deliberately, but unwittingly is encouraging this kind of very dangerous activity. So, uh, and, and again, it is now impinging on military bases. I will reserve the right to offer the amendment on the floor, perhaps, or at a later time, because I want to make very sure we do not turn military installations into permanent facilities that house the population that's coming, that has no business being there, and that those installations are not suited to handle. Uh, so, I, again, I'll take the administration to word that they're scrambling to get ahead of the problem, but it's going to take a policy change. It's not going to, we can't, can't just handle the flow better, you know, and do a better job. That's a good thing. Anytime somebody's in the, in the custody of our government, they need to be treated humanely. Uh, we need to do everything we can to protect them. But if, the, if it's going to be permanent residents in the United States, then we need to have that discussion and that debate. But I think what we've done is set off a mass exodus we, we're putting a lot of money into criminal activities. Uh, and again, it is extraordinarily dangerous for the young people themselves during the process of transportation. So uh, with that, I'll withdraw my amendment. With that, uh, uh, before you do so, would the gentleman yield? I certainly yield, the Chairman. The gentleman is correct in, in pointing out a major, major problem that Judge Carter and his subcommittee are trying to work with as well. But the numbers here are staggering, and the, and the, and the increase is staggering. Uh, as I recollect the figures, uh, in, a, in a normal year, it's like 6,000 uh, young people come across. Now it's up to some uh, 66,000 66, and headed, some people say, next year to 130,000 of kids. Out of those 66,000, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just for the point of information, only 1,700 are sent back. Rest are staying, and those are voluntary repatriation. Those are people, when they get here, they decide, I'd rather be home. Well, the, 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 Policies have consequences. These kids are instructed when they come across the line. They're not captured or, 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 or followed. These kids are told to volunteer to the Border Patrol, which they do, knowing that they're not going to be deported. And because the policy of this administration is 
we're not going to deport anybody unless they're a criminal. So the word is out down there. Hey, cross the border, surrender, and you're in. No consequence, no, no problem. And we've got to change the policy before we can confront the problem. Ms. Clare. I just want to just add a, a, a comment. Says a lot of it's happened in my congressional district, and glad you're going to withdraw that because I do have a, a concern also. Uh, the um, military bases are being considered or being used as Slacken Air Force Base in San Antonio, uh, Navy Base Ventura, California, Fort Still, Oklahoma, potentially Fort Knox schools pending DOD assessment. Um, and, and again, and I, I wish the administration would be a little bit more forthcoming in the information we have to go and ask for this information, and I wish there would be a little bit more forthcoming. But uh, as you know, it, it's actually a two-pronged approach that I think we need to look at. One, we certainly have to work with uh, Chairman Carter and David Price on this issue. That's Homeland. But again, that's playing defense on the one-yard line on the U.S.-Mexico border. We've got to work with K-Ranger. Uh, as you know, uh, if we do a better job at working with the Mexicans to secure the southern border with Guatemala, uh, then there will be less people. I just got back from Los Pinos in Mexico City, Mr. Chairman, and, and talking to the people at their White House, what, I call their, uh, what they call it Los Pinos, it's a problem to the Mexicans also because as they're trying to come over across, the drug cartels are picking some of the young men and recruiting them uh, to become part of the drug cartel, so they got a lot of Central Americans coming in. Now, it, the, the numbers are, and I'll be there this weekend uh, to go see the facilities, uh, and I've talked to some of the young kids before, and I have talked to them where they get raped, they get abused, because imagine the situation to put those young kids in the hands of a coyote, uh, a, a criminal, and you can understand what could happen coming in. Uh, to say this, Mr. Chairman, the numbers are, the, the numbers I've seen are 1,200 a day, 300 to 400 kids a day. Uh, last night they had a low number of only 270. And as you said a few minutes ago, you've got to understand the process, and this is what we need to coordinate. If you're a Mexican, then you do the immediate or voluntary uh, procedure right away. The Mexicans work with us. But if you're OTM other than Mexicans, when they come in, and it's, if you're an adult, you're detained until you have an immigration hearing. But if you're a family unit or a child without parents, then you're released. Uh, you're released pending an immigration hearing. And I would bet you that 90% of them are not going to show up because after you travel uh, thousands of miles and paid all money, you're not going to just uh, turn yourself in. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's not only working with Carter and Price on this particular issue, with, they've been doing a, a great job, but we've got to work with Kay because we've got to either play defense on the one-yard line or we play defense on the 20-yard line working with the Mexicans and Central and South America. You want to be here? Quickly retaining, reclaiming my time, and I'd certainly extend recognition again to my friend if he wants to. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on uh, Chairman Granger's committee a number of years ago. She actually led a Codell down in this area. so. Uh, you're right, and we need to spend some money down there, frankly, to be helpful uh, and try to make sure that population never leaves. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yield back. Chairman Freeland. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the gentleman from Oklahoma raising the, this point, it, as well as our other colleagues. This, this is a uh, humanitarian crisis involving juveniles and children. It does need to be addressed, and I think we've got uh, people around the table here that are uh, focusing on it, and, and certainly the use of Defense Department facilities is, uh, and they are being used, literally, uh, housing children, and obviously children have to have uh, medical and hygiene and health needs and food and uh, shelter needs, and uh, appreciate your withdrawing the amendment, but uh, this is a crisis that we need to address and yield back. Ms. Lilly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I just want to say to my friend, uh, Mr. Cole, I, Chairman Cole, I appreciate your thoughtful presentation and that of my friend, uh, ranking member Quayar, and I'm delighted that my uh, chairwoman, Kay Granger, is standing because this is the time, and maybe because this is so urgent, we will really focus on a comprehensive program. We need comprehensive immigration reform, number one. Secondly, to review some numbers that I just asked for an update. We're spending Customs Border Patrol $12.7 billion, Immigration Customs Enforcement $5.8 billion, Coast Guard $10 billion, 
of the DHS, 0 0.300, totaling $28.8 billion. That's what we're spending. I would hope that we can work with my friend, the chair of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee, and look at what kind of investments we are making. What are we doing in Honduras, in El Salvador? The whole region, Guatemala, is ripe with crime, death, these kids have no future, so their parents will say, go forth into the world. So we see that the Border Patrol is not keeping people out. I do think, uh, and Chairman Cole, I'd really like to work with you to look at everything we're doing across communities, but it has to begin, in my judgment, with comprehensive immigration reform. We've made no progress, and all we're doing is putting patrols on the border I don't see how those couple of hundred kids, uh, they're obviously not worried about the patrols. In fact, I understand from talking to you and others, they're saying, here I am, come get me. I'd be happy to yield and just in closing and I'll sit down, uh, or if I have to yield, I guess I have to stand. Uh, I really think this is such a critical issue today for a humane country. We've got to deal with the whole problem. Thank you and I'd be delighted to yield. Just, just for a few seconds, Mike, Mike. Just, just, just let me say this, Mr. Chairman. The, the smuggling organization, the, the questions have been asked of those people are being coming in, and the reasons <coughs> they've been given are economic and violence in their area. That's right. I'm sure the smuggling organization is getting the word out. But in talking to Border Patrol, they say that they'll come in and but, say, here I am, I'm turning myself in, because if you're an OTM and you're a family unit or a young kid, you're going to be, you're going to be released. The other thing is, the reason they're being coming through the southern border is because it's not their individual decisions, but according <coughs> to intelligence, it's the smuggling <laughs> organizations that make the decision mm -hmm. as to where to send them. So they're, they're flooding the zone at this particular time. I yield back the balance of my Well, I'm, I think I've used my time, but I understand from the stories is that these young people are threatened by the criminal signet, either join us or kill this person, or your lives and your families are in jeopardy. So thank you for bringing this issue up. I yield Chair back. Woman, I probably have no more time. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief, but just I was looking at an article that just appeared in the LA Times. It says, on Saturday alone, 367 children were taken from Texas to a processing center in Nogales, Arizona. The day before, 432 unaccompanied minors were taken to the same facility, and another 367 are expected tomorrow. It is a huge crisis. It's come very fast. But don't think that these children are making those decisions on their own. And I know it's very bipartisan when we talk about human trafficking, one of the most serious issues we can talk about. You watch where these children go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, this is a gigantic headache. Uh, let, me just, uh, let me just make some things clear. The conditions in Honduras uh, and, and San, San Salvador, El Salvador and Guatemala have not changed substantially for the last 10 years. If the children were at risk 10 years ago, they're at the same risk today. There's nothing new in, the, in what, what they, they face. The real issue is that the policy is being sold, and quite honestly, these children are being paid for, most of them by, by either parents or other relatives in the United States. They are sending somewhere between 2,500 and five grand, and sometimes more, whatever they can squeeze out of them. They're, made, they're sending this down to Mexico, hiring these people to transport them up, uh, up here, and they're bringing them by train loads, bus loads, as fast as they can get them to the border, and they have been told, walk across, find a border patrolman, surrender, you are an OTM, you will be released. And the reason they're in Nogales and other places is they have totally overwhelmed the Rio Grande Valley, and we're having to call on every processing center we can find to process these people. And the border patrol has a diligent policy of we're going to process everybody, no matter what, and that's why they're moving these kids around. They're not dumping these kids in Arizona. They're sending them there to be processed. The reality is, as was pointed out by Mr. Cole and others, they are turned loose because that's the nature of where we are in the policy of the government today. In addition, 
in order to process this surge, this unbelievable surge, which will be about probably 145,000 next year, somewhere between 120 and 145,000 next year, we take every time we do it, we pull Border Patrol off the off the border to process kids. And if you were in the in the valley today, you would see a room with people on top of literally on top of each other, and Border Patrol being called in from all over the the, the Texas border to come in and process these people. I am convinced that we will find that the surge of drugs and and people for criminal purposes are going to be coming across the border in record numbers as this diversion of a surge of children come across. And by the way, if an American citizen paid a criminal to transport their kid from someplace across a desert, put them in the hands of people that can rape and murder them, and then they showed up in the United States and appeared before a court of record, their parental rights would be terminated and the kid would be put up for adoption. That's the way it would work if you were an American who put your child in this kind of risk. This is a tragedy that's being created by the concept of catch and release is back if you're an OTM. This is a big crisis. We've got to figure out solutions. And we've got to stop the people from before they step foot on the soil. Because if we don't, if we don't, they're going to walk. Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cole, thank you very much for introducing this amendment. But I hope that in drafting the final that you'll also take into consideration sort of a challenge for the whole country to figure out where we're going to house people. We have no national disaster housing policy. I've been through seven uh, natural disasters where we're trying to earthquakes, floods, uh, where you have to move a lot of people and find places for them. FEMA doesn't do a very good job. They call in trailers, but those trailers can't be hooked up unless there's water unless there's electricity, unless there's sewer, and that doesn't happen when your ground is all torn up. So perhaps what we ought to be looking at is a national disaster housing policy. We have a lot of facilities, not only military bases, but uh, fairgrounds and, and other play camping areas, uh, churches that have put out uh, people in, uh, you know, in the wintertime for homeless. But I, if we fail to have places where people can actually go uh, when there's a, you know, a mass uh, need for them, uh, I think we're failing in not just in this area, and I hope that just this debate doesn't taint how you solve this problem without solving some of the domestic problems as well. Thank you. Ms. Kapter. Thank you, and I would indulge my colleague's attention just for a couple minutes here, and I thank Mr. Cole for raising this issue. In 1993, for those of us who were here, when the North American Free Trade Agreement passed over objections from members like myself, we tried to insert in that agreement a continental labor accord, some way of regularizing the workflow that the workers that would flow north as a result of that agreement. We were summarily dismissed. We were not allowed to offer amendments. And we predicted exactly what has happened in Mexico. Millions of people torn away from their traditional source of um, income, working on their little farms, their ejidos. And when you are hungry, you will do anything. And we have this gigantic continental exodus that has now been going on and accelerating over a number of decades. Yes, workers are also coming from Guatemala through Mexico into our country. They risk their lives in doing so. The judge well knows that. But I wanted to point out to my colleagues that if you are a worker that is trafficked, and labor trafficking is going on in huge proportion in this country, and we act like it isn't. And the problem isn't just these children. The problem is the draw of America's economy is so strong. It is a force that we as a Congress do not accommodate. I have tried. I have gone down to places like Monterey. Ohio gets 20,000 workers every year that work in landscape. I tried to work with our government as well as the government of Mexico said, let's create a list. We in Ohio will take the same 20,000 workers every year. We want to know who they are. We will care for their children. We'll put them in Head Start. We'll do all these things. They'll work under a regular labor contract. The consulate in Monterey goes, we don't want to be involved in that, on the US side. And so we continue to allow this ugly system of labor exploitation 
to occur in agriculture and industry. If you get your arm cut off in a meat plant in Iowa, and you're from Mexico, and you're here uh, as a guest worker without papers, you're sent back to Mexico. There's no disability payment. It's an ugly system. If you're a tobacco worker working in North Carolina and you die in the fields and you're not a U.S. citizen, who cares? I had a person in my district uh, who was training someone from Mexico to go out to the fields in Mexico and tell the workers, you don't have to be trafficked or take heroin to America. You can go under a regular labor contract and go pick tomatoes in, in Ohio or pickles in, in uh, Michigan. And uh, 27 years old, Santiago Tru Cruz went back to Mexico to tell people in the fields in Mexico, you don't have to go to America that way. You can go under a contract where your rights are protected. He was killed in Monterey in a labor office with his hands tied behind his back. 3 a.m. in the morning, the computer music was blaring. No prosecution. I went down there to that state, got off the airplane to go with my friend who had trained him, and the federal police, all crooks, they, came, they, they made us get off the airplane and stand out there in the hot sun for an hour and a half. We are not dealing, folks, here with a regular flow of labor. Labor is being trapped. That is the force underneath it all. And yes, we concentrate on children, and I care about children. I have godchildren. I have uh, plenty of young people in our family, in our community. But this issue of the unattended consequences of NAFTA related to the exodus of poor people who are desperate from countries south of our border is so significant. Our trade agreements don't deal with it. I appreciate the gentleman bringing up the issue, but you have only hit the tip of a gigantic iceberg. I thank my colleagues for listening. Mr. Coles, recognized for a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said, I'm going to withdraw the amendment, but I think the, the discussion here has been very helpful, very good, very bipartisan. I appreciate that. I do want to emphasize a point my friend uh, Judge Carter made. This is not a, you know, immediate crisis. There wasn't a hurricane. There's not a famine. That this, these conditions have existed for a long time. They're not good conditions, but they've been there a long time. Yet we have this surge. That suggests to me that it's our policy that are attracting people here. You, you will pay the money and you will take a very dangerous journey with terrible people, run all these risks because you think if you get here, you're going to be allowed to stay. Now, if we're going to do that, if, you, if you're an unaccompanied minor, 13 to 17 years old, and the policy is if you just get to the border and you're not from Mexico, you get to come and you get to stay, basically, then this traffic will never stop. And if we want to do that, we should have a national debate about this. But this is very much, I think, and I don't, again, I'm not an expert here. I'm trying to learn as I go along because this just sort of blew up in my district because it's going to blow up in some of yours. Uh, but we need to look at the fundamental policy the administration's adopted here. The amendment is withdrawn. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment of the desk. And I will read. Reading. Amendment offered by Mr. Price. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is uh, quite straightforward. It would prohibit funds from being used to divert, relocate, or otherwise disrupt the mission of certain Air Force units that are co-located with another service like the Army and that provide a, at least 25 percent of the airborne training missions on base. I uh, represent a congressional district that abuts uh, Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg is home to one such co-located unit, the Air Force Reserve 440th Airlift Wing. Fort Bragg's home to not only the 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd Airborne Division, but also to Army Special Operations Command and Joint Special Operations Command, among others. With the co-location status of the 440th Airlift Wing units and personnel at Pope Army Airfield provide a unique training and readiness capability to all of these units. But I, I want to be clear. My amendment is not simply about Fort Bragg or the economic impact, which would be considerable, of shuttering the 440th. If that were the uh, sum total of the matter, I'd still be pushing to mitigate the impact, but I probably wouldn't offer an amendment here this morning. The amendment has much broader significance. It is about readiness, it is about training, and it's about fulfillment of congressional intent and diligent oversight of the monies appropriated by this committee. Let me briefly explain. The fiscal year 2013 Defense Authorization established an intra-theater airlift working group which recommended basing 
10 C-130 aircraft at Pope Army Airfield in order to further the training mission of the 82nd Airborne. Instead of continuing to abide by this recommendation and others like it, the Air Force has proposed deactivating the wing altogether and diverting the C-130s to another installation hundreds of miles away from Fort Bragg and away from the thousands of airborne personnel who depend on them for training in order to fulfill their responsibilities as our nation's premier global rapid response force. Never mind the fact that this diversion of aircraft would be a bad idea for our airborne capacity in general. Over the last four years, this particular wing has provided one-third of all the airborne training lift capacity for the 82nd Airborne. The co-location of the wing has also proven critical for our global rapid response objectives. I'll just cite one example. Fort Bragg-based assets were on the ground in Haiti just 14 hours after the horrendous earthquake there. Our ability to coordinate such rapid response would surely be hindered by depending on aircraft located hundreds of miles away from the personnel and the equipment they support. Now, it purports to save money over the next uh, several years, but the Air Force seems to overlook the fact that $60 million has already been spent by both Air Force and Army in recent years to upgrade facilities at Pope, including the construction of a nearly completed mm -hmm. C-130-specific training simulator facility in anticipation of the change. In fact, if you were to go to Fort Bragg today, you would see construction ongoing for that same simulator facility. Without this amendment, we're simply throwing that money away and permitting the administration to bypass the intent of Congress. I urge adoption of my amendment. Chairman Friedman. Mr. Chairman, I rise to oppose the amendment. While I sympathize with the gentleman's concern, here's the reality. Budgets are declining. Force structure is declining. There are fewer planes and resources to go around for all the bases and all the components. This, is, this unit is just one of many at the Fort Bragg Pope Airfield Complex. As you mentioned, there's the 82nd Airborne Division, including the Ready Brigade that must be able to deploy anywhere on short notice. There's a third uh, Special Forces Group. This is one of the biggest Army bases in the world. It's not going to go away. The Air Force will re retain C-130s with the Air National Guard at Charlotte. It seems to us that these aircraft and others in the force can provide the necessary uh, airlift to support the missions at Bragg. I also want to note the curious way the gentleman's amendment is written. It specifies uh, any Air Force Reserve unit co-located on an Army installation, which has provided at least 25 percent of annual airborne training missions on, on site over the last four years. We're, we are unaware of any other unit that fits that description. So I understand your desire to uh, protect uh, the base. We're dealing with big, tough issues in the bill. In the context, this is just one of the smaller things we have to accept, given the budgetary situation we've imposed on our military. We cannot take a rifle shot approach to every single unpleasant force structure decision. For that reason and, and others, I oppose the gentleman's amendment. Is there further discussion? The gentleman is recognized a minute to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand very well what the, uh, what the Chairman is saying about uh, both the, uh, the need for flexibility in the way we uh, provide this support, this training uh, backup for our, for our units, and also the uh, desire to economize. My point is simply that uh, the uh, deactivation of this wing in, in this case uh, is, uh, is counterproductive in terms of those objectives. And I am making this argument in general terms. Uh, uh, wherever this sort of circumstance uh, was, uh, was present, I would, would, would make uh, the same argument. So in terms of the, the kind of training and the airlift capacity that this provides, and in terms of the uh, investment that's already been made to, to build up this capacity, I, uh, I believe this is a misguided decision. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, sure, it has a local impact. It has a four break impact. But it's much broader than that in terms of the, uh, of the wisdom of the decision and the, and the financial implications. And so I, um, I urge adoption of this amendment. question is on the Price Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 No have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Fortenberry. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Fortenberry. At the end of the bill before the short title, insert the following. None of the funds made available in this act may be used to provide weapons to combatants in Syria. recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe this amendment is actually consistent with portions of the underlying bill in which we reaffirm our policy that the United States should not enter into armed conflict in Syria. Uh, along the Syrian-Turkish border, there is a family with six children, and one of their sons is named Elias. And Elias, in his little town in Syria, was going to school one day, and he had his hand on the school door. And all of a sudden, everything went black. Another hand came over his mouth. He struggled to get away, but he was whisked into a van and kidnapped. Now, Elias' family is pretty fortunate in that they were able to get him back and were able to flee the country. They were the lucky ones. There's 160,000 other Syrians dead. Now, in this rebel movement, this opposition movement that has sprung up in Syria, it is a patchwork network of shifting alliances, al-Qaeda and jihadist uh, infighting. Even if we were able to vet and arm moderate elements of this movement, there is no guarantee that these weapons would be captured by people who oppose our views. There's no guarantee that alliances would further shift. On one side of this conflict, we have the Russians, the Iranians, Hezbollah, and Assad. And on the other side, we have jihadists, Al-Qaeda, and potentially us. That's not a sustainable coalition. I think the better policy should be to continue our very substantial support for humanitarian assistance to the Syrian refugee community. We should continue to reaffirm our relationship with Israel as we do in this bill, reestablish the relationship with Turkey, sustain the Jordanians' capacity to absorb all of this refugee population that's flowing into the country. And on another note, rebuild the relationship with the Egyptians who are struggling to overcome the destabilizing elements in the Sinai Desert. That is a proper geopolitical policy that we should pursue. That is the right way to enter into the broader framework of this very, very hard situation where there are no good options. I simply believe the potential of supplying weapons to shifting alliances could potentially make a bad situation worse, and I urge adoption of this amendment. Chairman has Mr. Chairman, I, I rise to oppose the gentleman's amendment. While I appreciate the, sen appreciate the sentiment of the amendment, this is a complicated issue with multifaceted policy ramifications that could really, really can't be de fully debated on this bill at this time and place. The situation in Syria remains highly complicated and poses imminent threats to the United States and allied interests, particularly Israel and Jordan, Jordan Jordanian security. Recognizing congressional concerns regarding U.S. potential U.S. military involvement in Syria, our bill already contains a provision, Section 9013, uh, which prohibits the introduction of U.S. military forces into hostilities in Syria, except in accordance with the War Powers Act. However, this amendment, in my judgment, goes too far in, in that it attempts to tie the U.S. government's hands in navigating the complicated situation we, and more importantly, our allies, Israel and Jordan, face related, face related to threats emanating from Syria. We have to be realistic. There are many countries, including our allies, as well as many groups already involved in Syria. This amendment would do nothing to stop the arming of the Syrian opposition. What this amendment would do is to remove any possibility of the U.S. engaging under any circumstances, even if such engagement, engagement would be in the, in the best interests of the United States and the aforementioned allies. For example, this amendment would preclude the United States from providing assistance to an opposition force fighting to defeat a terrorist group planning to attack Jordan. It would also preclude the U.S. from engaging should chemical weapons being removed fall into terrorist hands or from assisting the Syrian people in defending their towns and villages from terrorist groups. As the Assad regime and opposition forces have fought to a stalemate in the chaos, in the chaos and governed and, and unsecured spaces are being exploited by terrorists and foreign fighters to create safe havens. 
from which to attack, to prepare attacks against the U.S. and its allies. We certainly cannot count on the Assad regime to protect U.S. interests. And need I mention the millions of refugees, four million that are outside of Syria, and the number of displaced people in Syria. Given the ever-changing dynamics in Syria, the rising terrorist threat coming from that country, I do not think it is in the best interest of the United States to remove the President's ability to use all the instruments of national power to protect U.S. interests. Nor do I think it sends the correct message to the Syrian people at a time uh, when they have suffered through three years of a brutal war. Therefore, I must oppose the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wisklowski. Chairman, I think the uh, chairman of the subcommittee has stated it well. I would add my voice in opposition. I do also appreciate the gentleman's concern uh, as far as our possible military engagement in Syria. I think the chairman was very clear as far as restrictive language in the bill itself. Uh, I do think the gentleman uh, overstated uh, the issue as to the simplicity of the opposition. Uh, but it is a deep concern to all of us in the committee and especially on the subcommittee and would want members to understand that the uh, subcommittee understands clearly our oversight obligation under Title 50 uh, relative to the composition of the various opposition groups. Uh, it is a very hard situation. It is a very fluid situation, all the more reason to make sure this nation has as many options as possible. So do join uh, the chair in opposition to the uh, gentleman's well-intended uh, amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Fortenberry is recognized to close for one minute. Uh, I appreciate the uh, comments. If this is truly such a fluid situation, there is a great risk in arming groups if we potentially go that direction, who we know not much about, whose alliances could very radically shift. If we need to do that, we can come back and revisit the question. That is the obligation of Congress. Talk to the refugee families. Talk to Muslims and Christian families who have fled this country. And they'll tell you, if this opposition movement, these rebels succeed, conditions will be worse. Their brutality is well known in an already brutal situation in that, in that country. I urge adoption of the amendment. The question is on the Fort Berry Amendment. All in favor say aye. All opposed say no. No. No seem to have it and do have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Lee. I have an, amend an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Lee number two. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. Lee at the end of the bill before the spending reduction account. Insert the following. None of the funds made available by this act may be obligated or expended pursuant to the authorization for use of military force against Iraq resolution of 2000. Consent to dispense Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is, um, it should be a simple amendment. It's, I thought it was until I talked to some members, so I'd like to explain it. Uh, it would just basically prohibit funding for any operations or activities pursuant to the 2002 authorization for the use of military force in Iraq. Thanks. The war in Iraq is over. So why is this amendment necessary? More than two years ago, since United States troops withdrew from Iraq, the 2002 authorization for the use of military force remains in law, and this committee allows for uh, its funding. Two years ago, President Obama declared that the war is over. And in recent months, the White House has signaled its support for repealing this 2002 AUMF. According to a statement by White House spokesperson Kat Caitlin Hayden, the administration supports the repeal of the Iraq AUMF since it is no longer used for any government activities. Now, some of us voted against the invasion of Iraq in 2002 and the underlying authorization, but that's not what this amendment is about. Now that our brave young men and women have come home and the practical side of the mission is concluded, it's important and necessary to bring the war to an official legal end. And that means we must do what we can do within the jurisdiction of this committee. And this committee holds the purse strings. And so we should not continue to allow the funding of a war that has ended. We must stop this country from 
continuing to uh, exist in a state of perpetual war anytime, any place, anywhere. And of course, refocus our efforts in creating jobs and nation building here at home. That's what some of us believe. But that, once again, has nothing to do with why this amendment is important. This amendment is important because we should not allow the funding to continue of an authorization which authorized a war that has already ended. And so, Mr. Chairman, I urge a vote uh, for this amendment. It makes sense. If we want to reauthorize the war or some military activities or combat operations, we go back, we reauthorize it through the authorizing committee, and then we fund it through this committee. And all I'm asking is that we not fund the authorization because the war is over. Well, the gentlelady yield. Uh, how does the gentlelady respond to the argument or point that this is an authorization issue uh, beyond our capability? Uh, the, the very definition of your amendment is the unauthorizing of a uh, previous authorization for war. How do you respond to that? Well, Mr. Chairman, this just says no funding will be allowed. That's within the jurisdiction of this committee. We hold the purse strings. The Appropriations Committee funds the wars. And given that, this is germane to this committee. And all this amendment says is no funds will be allowed to support the authorization. Mr. Visklowski. Vis Chairman, thank you very much for the uh, recognition. Uh, I arise in support of the gentlewoman's uh, amendment uh, and would point out, uh, if I could parenthetically, to the chairman's question of the gentlewoman from California, this is a limitation amendment, and in a way, uh, I would suggest that uh, Ms. Lee's approach is the same that the chairman took relative to the uh, Section 1035 issue earlier today, uh, and that is to have a limitation to force a debate on this issue. Uh, when this authorization was passed, uh, the intent was uh, to ensure the President uh, could determine uh, whether or not uh, we could adequately protect the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq not likely to lead to enforcement of all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. All but a couple of hundred service members are out of Iraq today. The circumstances have changed. In all fairness to the debate, uh, the authority also said to be consistent, the United States and other countries continuing to take the necessary actions against international terrorists and terrorist organizations, including those nations, organizations, and persons who planned, authorized, and committed the terrorist attacks of September 11. The world and the situation we face has significantly changed. I think the limitation is appropriate uh, to, again, encourage a revisitation of that authorization as to what is appropriate in 2014. I appreciate the gentlewoman offering the amendment. Chairman Freelinghuisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise in opposition to the gentlewoman's amendment. Uh, uh, as we all know, U.S. military action in Iraq came to an end in December of 2011. I want everyone to make sure, and I'm sure she knows, there are no funds in this act for military action in Iraq pursuant to, to the authority of the Iraqi uh, uh, authority of force resolution. Its grant of authority has both practically and legally ended. This amendment is, quite honestly, an amendment in search of a problem, a problem that, that really no longer exists. It, it is largely symbolic. I respect that. At, at a time when sectarian tensions are at their highest level since we left, and terrorists have once again succeeded in capturing control of Fallujah and Ramadi, and, and may I say they're not only terrorists, Al Qaeda is back in town. Uh, what kind of message are we sending with this amendment to both the Iraqi people and to the men and women who so valiantly serve there? Let me repeat, there are no funds in this act for the purpose, for the purpose that the gentlelady is seeking to limit. I, I understand from time to time it's important to make a political statement uh, on our actions in Iraq. That war is over. Uh, I re urge rejection of the amendment. Ms. Lee is recognized for a minute to close. 
Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank both uh, the chair and ranking member for, for their comments and statements. And just want to say, this is uh, not a political statement. I think it's very important that this committee uh, recognize, first of all, that uh, we have the authority, the purse strings, to put into this bill affirmation of the fact that we're not going to fund a war that does not exist. Uh, this amendment would not impact the President's authority to protect the embassy or personnel in Iraq. Uh, the message it sends, I believe, is that if, if we want to fund and if the authorizing committee wants to reauthorize some military or combat actions or, or whatever, let them authorize it and we go back and we'll decide if we want to fund that. But I think it's absolutely essential that um, we go on record in this bill saying that we're not going to allow any funds. We're going to do that and uh, I think it's critical that the people in our country understand that this war has finally come to an end and that we have written into this bill that we're not going to allow any funding for such an activity. Thank Qu you again. Question. It's on the Lee Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Noes have it. The gentlelady requests a recorded vote. All in favor of such a vote will raise your hand. A sufficient number. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar. No. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Deloro. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. Dent? No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Blart. No. Mr. diaz Blart, no. Mr. Farr? Aye. Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah? No. Mr. Fleischman? No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? No. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelinghuisen? No. Mr. Freelinghuisen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? No. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Hera Butler? Yeah. Ms. Hera Butler, no. Mr. Honda? Yeah. Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce? Yeah. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Kaptur? Aye. Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kingston? No. Mr. Kingston, no. Mr. Latham? No. Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowey? Aye. Mrs. Lowey, aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran? Aye. Mr. Nunnally? Aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Pastor, aye. Ms. Ms. Pingree? Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby? Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers? No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney? No. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roby Allard? Aye. Ms. Roby Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano? Mr. Simpson? No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo? No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Visklowski? Mr. Visklowski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf? No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack? No. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder? No. Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Fatah. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Fatah, aye. Members wishing to change their votes? <laughs> Clerk will tally. <coughs> On this vote, the yeas are 17, the nays are 31. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is uh, Lee number three. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. Lee. At the end of the bill, before the spending reduction account, insert the following. Not later than 180 days after the date of the enactment of this act, and once every 180 Ask days the thereafter. Be dispensed. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, this <laughs> amendment requires the President to report to Congress <coughs> all instances. Now, mind you, I just want to repeat it's a report. It reminds the President that uh, we uh, still should be uh, informed with regard to where the, the 2001 authorization for use of military force has been invoked to justify operations abroad. 
I believe, and I know all of you agree, it's our obligation to conduct rigorous oversight, accountability, and demand transparency and have a meaningful debate about this endless state of war that our country is in. In order for us to have that debate, we need a full accounting and sufficient information about the history of the AUMF. And for those who were not here uh, during that very uh, horrific, terrible time right after 9-11, let me read you the one short sentence out of the uh, AUMF. This is just one sentence. It says, the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001. Now that was, what, 13 years ago. Most authorizations end after five or six years. This authorization is still on the book. That single sentence essentially has provided this president, the prior president, and any future president the authority to wage war against anyone, anywhere, at any time, any nation without coming to Congress. Myself, Congressman Schiff, and others have been trying to end this authorization or to repeal it. We're building some bipartisan support, incidentally, for that. But I know we don't share a common position on repealing the AUMF. Um, many of us can agree that the overly broad authority represents a major and very concerning deterioration of congressional oversight. Many of us also agree that a debate and a vote on, a future, on the future of the AUMF is long overdue and is necessary and should take place. And I remember that evening, uh, we had maybe one hour debate for those who were here. Uh, we still haven't had a full debate on um, the implications and the impact of what that authorization um, has invoked. And so this amendment includes language giving the president the authority to provide information in a classified and unclassified format, the uh, times and activities where the AUMF has been used as the legal justification. Uh, I've asked the Congressional Research Service to give us what they could, and they've cited over uh, 30 instances. And so, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important that we simply, in this bill, ask for a report. That's all I'm asking for. And I think the public deserves that. This committee deserves that. Mr. Visklaski. Uh, Chairman, I uh, rise in support of the gentlewoman's uh, amendment and would point out, uh, based on the last uh, colloquy we had, that the world has changed since 2002. Uh, hopefully the administration is moving towards uh, suggesting we have new, different authorization. And I do think the request for information through a report would set a factual basis so that the administration and members of Congress could have a factual examination of where we are today to base that new authorization on and think it's a very reasonable request and therefore support it. Thank you very much. Chairman Freeling, I The Chairman, uh, I rise in uh, respectful opposition to the gentlewoman's amendment. This amendment would ask the Department of Defense to provide both a classified and a public accounting for each and every uh, activity conducted by the military related to the authorization of use of military force. Congress provided the President as Commander-in-Chief the necessary authorization to protect the United States against those who would do us harm. It's unclear what is to be gained from this amendment or whether it could even be implemented. Our troops in Afghanistan are fighting every day under the authorization provided by Congress. Do we want a compilation each and, of each and every operation being conducted there in Afghanistan? Our troops are working with foreign partners to counter terrorist threats emanating from Yemen, Syria, and Africa. What purpose is to be gained from the Department reporting every individual troop deployment and every military aircraft being flown to protect against terrorist attacks? There are already numerous mechanisms in place to ensure congressional notification and oversight actions taken under this authority. And Congress already receives a War Powers Report every six months, which identifies places where our military is engaged. For the most sensitive classified military operations, there are already appropriate notification and oversight mechanisms to the Congressional Oversight Committees. In addition, 
the fiscal year 2014 National Defense Authorization Act included bipartisan provisions which codified and formalized congressional oversight of sensitive military operations. To force the Department of Defense to compile a comprehensive report for every single military activity, troop movement, or operation, even in summary form, with a detailed classified annex, would re risk providing a roadmap for the terrorists and hostile nations. But more troubling, it would put at risk the lives of military servicemen and women who conduct those type of operations each and every day. I strongly oppose the amendment and urge a no vote. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment. Um, I rise in support of the amendment. Uh, Representative Lee and I and others uh, on the other side of the aisle have been trying to raise the issue of the increasingly outdated and legally precarious nature of the AOMF that we continue to rely upon. Uh, now, uh, after more than a decade, uh, the AUMF is being utilized in ways never, I think, uh, foreseen at the time it was passed. This is not to say that the danger doesn't exist. There's no effort here to legislate away the terrorist threat. That can't be done. Uh, but it is a way of calling attention to the very real legal and constitutional problem that we have created by allowing this AUMF to be utilized for so long. And it poorly describes the nature of the conflict that we're in. And just to give you one, I think, quite perfect illustration, uh, ISIL, probably one of the most violent organizations operating anywhere on the globe, now operating in Syria, um, has been formally excommunicated from Al-Qaeda. So you have the formal affiliate of Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, in Syria, and you have ISIL, which uh, the head, now head of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has said is no longer part of Al-Qaeda. So does that mean that because of the AUMF that we are operating under that says that we can go after al-Qaeda and its affiliates, that we have empowered now Zawahiri to decide who we can use our authorization to use force against and who we can't. That we have delegated to our enemy to decide who is within the parameters of this AOMF. I think it just goes to show uh, that this AOMF uh, needs to be revised, repealed, or a new one drawn up. And the only reason we haven't, frankly, is because the decision about what ought to come next is so difficult. Uh, and so for a Congress that is continually critical of a president operating, uh, as many say, beyond his authority or at the peak of his authority, uh, a lot of responsibility is our own uh, for continuing to rely on something that we know is not uh, uh, up to the uh, uh, current nature of the conflict. This amendment, uh, while not a repeal, uh, or even a sunset, uh, at least helps to inform the Congress of the actions that are be taking under the authority that we have provided. Uh, I think it's a way of holding ourselves accountable, but uh, frankly, I think we need to go much further uh, and, uh, and decide if we're going to continue to authorize force, and reluctantly I think that's going to be necessary, what that should look like and how that should be defined. Uh, and I want to compliment my colleague for offering the amendment and urge uh, your support. Ms. Lee is recognized for a minute to close. Thank you, and I want to thank uh, our ranking member and congressmanship for your comments and, and for your support uh, in ex explaining this uh, very important uh, amendment and the rationale for, for this. I think it's important to recognize in my there is no way, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I would um, want to put any of our troops in harm's way or give, signal a roadmap about what uh, our actions and activities are. This a actually, as for it to be the information in the report to be submitted in classified and an unclassified summary. Uh, the the uh, Secretary of Defense couldn't, can decide. I think the Congress, though, you know, we're, we're losing our uh, responsible, the authority for what we're supposed to do, our constitutional authority, by abdicating all of the time at this point uh, to any administration uh, these authorizations and these funding of, of the wars and the use of forces. This report only asks the administration to give us the times in which they have actually used this AUMF as the legal justification for whatever activity. I think members of Congress deserve that. Uh, if you don't, then uh, I can understand um, 
not voting for it, but I think con members of Congress really need to be put back into the process in exercising our uh, constitutional responsibility. This helps us do that. Thank you again. The question is on the Lee Amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. 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 Those have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Recorded vote is requested. Vote. Those supporting us, a recorded vote will raise your hand as efficient number. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw. No. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson. No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. diaz Blard. Mr. diaz Blard, no. Mr. Farr. Aye. Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? Yes. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Freelingheisen? No. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Vera Butler? Ms. Vera Butler? Mr. Honda? Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce? Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Kaptur? Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kingston? Mr. Kingston, no. Mr. Latham? No. Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy? Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran? Mr. Nunnally? Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Pastor, aye. Ms. Pingree? Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby? Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney? Yes. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Robo Allard? Aye. Ms. Robo Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano? Mr. Simpson? No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo? No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Viskoski? Aye. Mr. Viskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf? No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack, Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder, Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members wishing to be recorded, Mr. Dent? Mr. Dent is not recorded. No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. Fatah, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Anyone wishing to change the vote? <laughs> Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 21, the nays are 27. Amendment is not agreed to. Ms. DeLauro. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. DeLauro. Oh, yes, you Strike know. section. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. The amendment uh, which strengthens the ban on the Defense Department's business with Russia's uh, state arms dealer. Since 2011, the department has awarded Russia's arms exporter, Russia Boronoran, uh, export with more than $1 billion in no-bid contracts for the procurement of 63 Russian helicopters for the Afghan National Security Forces. This despite the fact that the firm has been providing weapons that are fueling the war in Syria. Thanks to a bipartisan congressional effort, namely myself and other members of this committee, uh, Congresswoman Granger, Congressman Jim Moran, Congressman Kingston, the Pentagon did cancel a planned future purchase of these helicopters. My amendment simply seeks to ensure that the Defense Department does not engage in further contracts or subcontracts related to helicopters or other weapons with uh, Rosaboran export. I want to thank the chairman and ranking member for including a ban on these contracts and requiring the secretary to report on the firm's arms exports to Syria and whether any alternative 
namely American-made sources, can be used if he chooses to waive the ban for national security reasons. What the amendment would do was to further take into account Russia's recent action in Ukraine by requiring the Secretary to certify that the Russian arms dealer ceased transferring weapons to Syria, that Russia pulled out of Crimea, Russian forces or Russian forces have withdrawn from the eastern border of Ukraine, and that Russia is not otherwise actively destabilizing Ukraine if he uses the national security waiver authority. Any such certification would be reviewed by the Defense Department Inspector General. Similar language was unanimously approved in the Defense Authorization Bill last month, and I urge my colleagues to support my amendment today. Chairman uh, Frillinghausen, does the gentlelady finally have a good idea? She does, and the committee is uh, pleased to accept her amendment, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady always has good ideas, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I just might add, and I appreciate that, I was, had the honor of being in Normandy uh, this past weekend. I was asked to be part of the, the uh, congressional delegation along with my colleague, Mr. Fortenberry, and there may be others. Uh, and one of the briefings that we held with the embassy um, uh, indicated that, in fact, the French uh, government, uh, and we're trying to dissuade the French government, from selling Mistral helicopters uh, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the Russians. And um, I, I pointed out at that meeting that I think we need to set the example if we want to uh, uh, ask other countries not to do business uh, with Russia, then we have to be prepared uh, to, do the, to do the same things. Um, I just want further footnote. Uh, so many of you may have been to Normandy, but it was the most emotional and poignant experience in the 24 years that I have served here. I had the opportunity to meet a constituent who scaled the cliffs at Pointe de Hoc. And these were unbelievable stories from the veterans. And, and my colleague, Mr. Fortenberry, has a personal story with regard to his family uh, and the landing on Normandy. So I think if we are there again, if if we want other countries to do something, we need to lead the way. I thank the chairman and the ranking member on the um, The question, question is on the DeLauro Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Are there any other amendments? If not, Chairman Wolf is recognized for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the defense appropriation bill for fiscal year 2015 to the House. You've heard the uh, motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment, uh, the motion is adopted. A uh, three day notice uh, is placed. Um, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be given the authority to make technical and conforming change to the items approved today without objection. So ordered. There being no further business, the committee stands adjourned. We've got food. Thanks very much. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Good job. Appreciate it. I think it worked out pretty well. Good job, Defense Appropriations.